So Tilly is a quasi-local. She is a teacher at the Center for Cartoon Studies up in White River Junction. Um, her most recent book is Clementine, and it's going to be a trilogy. And part two is out in 2023. Clementine, volume one, is out now. And she's got an artist talk that will explain a little bit more. So I'll just wrap it up and bring on Tilly. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming to this, really. Thank you, this is great. Um, all right, just sort of uh, an artist talk. Hopefully this is relevant if any of you are writers, cartoonists, um, aspiring creatives of any, any type. I hope something about how I got here could be, could be helpful to you all. But um, I never thought I was gonna be a cartoonist. I really just wanted to be an adult. I thought that was like the best place to get because I wanted autonomy and I hated school. Um, and so I, I don't really have that artist story where you know, they say when she was five, she never stopped drawing. And she, she always said she wanted to be cartoonist. Absolutely not true. Even if you asked me when I was 16, if I was gonna be a cartoonist, I would say, no, absolutely not. Um, and yet I think who you are as an artist gets made slowly over time. So everything that you read and take in in your life, I think has an influence on how you are in relationships, what you end up to create, like it all, it all plays in together. And so some of the things that really influenced me, I love Richard Scarry's Busy Busy Town and all his books. This is uh, Little Nemo in Slumberland by Windsor McKay, very old artist at this point, but my dad got me a book of his comics that I really liked. I didn't like reading the comics, I just liked looking at them. Um, and when I was younger, I read a lot of manga. Manga is the word for comics in Japanese, and it refers to all the comics that come out of Japan. And these were two that really I really loved. They are sort of marketed towards boys, but I really liked them. Should have taken that as an indicator that I might have been a lesbian, but we found that out later. Um, but I loved reading comics, but I didn't think like just because I liked reading comics, why does that mean that I could actually somehow make them? I was really just a fan. Um, and I was also a child of the 90s, Drake and John, Josh, so I Carly in there, Hey Arnold, Arthur, as told by Ginger, if anyone remembers that show. Um, again, like all these things were things I really liked that I now sometimes see pop up in my own work. Color palettes that remind me of 90s cartoons or like certain mannerisms or types of stories. Uh, the Simpsons was again a big influence, but what's interesting about influence and artistic influence is it doesn't mean that I actually draw like The Simpsons. And yet there's a lot of sunset colors in The Simpsons. There's pink, there's warmth, they're family stories, or at least to me they were family stories because I didn't get the jokes. And so I thought that The Simpsons was just like a sweet, a sweet story about maybe an alcoholic dad, but I loved Bart and Lisa. Um, and one of the most important influences on my work is the work of Studio Ghibli uh, and Hayao Miyazaki. They made uh, movies like My Neighbor Totoro, Spirited Away, Kiki's Delivery Service. And there was this one thing about all the Studio Ghibli movies that stayed with me forever, which is that, so that's a Totoro. I, I don't know what that is. That's just a Totoro. And there's these kids and they're just like, oh my God, a Totoro. And there is no point in the movie where they're like, wait, what is it? And it's the same thing in Spirited Away, like Haku turns out to be a dragon. At one point, she's never like, why are you a dragon? How is that possible? Wait, you're a river spirit? There's never this feeling of anyone questioning or having to validate the world. And so in all my stories, every time I put something in that feels sort of unbelievable or impossible, it stayed with me that I'm allowed to just do that. I don't have to explain anything to anyone unless I really feel like I want to. Um, so Studio Ghibli was a huge influence and I started drawing in high school. I took some art classes and I picked it up pretty quickly. Um, I had done some doodling as a kid, but I had that symptom of being a kid who like gets a sketchbook for Hanukkah and then I draw one line in it and I'm like, I ruined it. It's over, I'm not drawing in it anymore. So I have a lot of notebooks from childhood that have like one line in them and I, I was done with it. But in high school, I really did start to draw for my art class. I started to get into it. Um, I was homesick a lot as a kid and I realized why not spend your sick day drawing in bed. And the turning point for me was when I was 16, my dad, who was much more into comics than I was into comics, was like, Tilly, I signed you up for a comics class. And I was like, why? And he was like, I wanna take it, but I have work. So you're gonna go and tell me about it. And I was like, 
fine, whatever, very surly 16 year old. Um, and it turned out that that class was taught by Scott McCloud. And Scott McCloud is very well known in our comics industry. If you have not heard of him, he wrote these sort of seminal books about how comics work. And it also turns out that Scott McCloud is one of the nicest people on the planet Earth. And as a 16 year old, I literally think the reason I got into comics is because Scott McCloud was nice to me. I was not used to adults giving me easy affection or just immediate warmth. I grew, I was a figure skater. I came from a family of musicians. You like, you practice, you work hard. People tell you about your mistakes. That's what I was used to. And in Scott's class, I drew a comic because that's what he asked us to do. And it, I will tell you verifiably, I've looked back at it. It's not good. It makes no sense. It is drawn poorly. And yet he looked at it and he looked at me and he was like, this is really good. And he was like, I think you should stick with this. I think you're, you're really good at this. And because that man looked in my eyes and told me that, I've since published like 10 graphic novels and never stopped doing this. I'm married to a cartoonist. So Scott did a lot for me. I, since, I saw him a few years later and I was like, Scott, do you realize what your kindness did to me? And he was like, I don't really remember you, but that's great that I was so nice to you. Um, it's okay that he doesn't remember me. I remember him. And so because of that moment with Scott, I came home from the comics class. I was like, dad, get out of my way. I got to work on comics. And it turned out that for an anxious, lonely little lesbian in Texas, making comics was actually a fantastic outlet um, until I discovered therapy a little while later. That was also a great outlet. Um, but I realized making comics made me feel like myself. And I liked that I got to make them alone. I liked that I could make them and I didn't have to show them to anyone. And I realized that all the comics I had read before, I could look back at them to get new ideas, to do stuff. And this all led to me coming to my parents at the end of high school and telling them much to their disappointment that I was not going to go to college. Uh, I was going to go to comic school, which is in White River Junction, Vermont. Um, we were in Austin, Texas at the time. And they were not pleased about this whole like not going to college thing and this like maybe comics thing. And part of it was that my parents saw me working on comics a lot, but they didn't, I don't know, they had no reason to think that there, this would ever be a career for me. It's very obscure, it's very niche. And the school that I wanted to go to was an MFA program. So people were going there getting their masters, but they also let in other students of any age to just get a certificate. And so my highest form of education was just gonna be a certificate in cartooning, which I was thrilled about. I thought that sounded great. Um, and now when I go to doctor's offices and they're like highest form of education, it's like, do I do high school or do I do certificate of cartooning? <laughs> which one do they wanna see? Um, I usually do high school. <laughs> I was like, I can't explain this. Um, and basically we, it was hard for me and my parents to agree on this, but I, I wouldn't give in and they let me go to CCS um, and I moved up there and I, there are no dorms, there's no nothing. It's just a school, you go to it. I had to get an apartment, I had to get a job and I loved it. I loved going to CCS. It was two years of comic summer camp. All we did was draw and I was surrounded in a class of people who had lived these long lives. So my college experience was like hanging out with guys in their 30s and learning about life from them. And they told me some lies. They were like, your 20s are gonna be hard. My 20s haven't been that hard. My 20s have been delightful, um, but that's okay. They had their own, their own worldview. And now while I was at CCS, um, I was a figure skater before, as I had mentioned. And so I had a very strong sense of how you get good at something. And in ice skating, how you get good at something is you wake up at 4 a.m. and you show up at practice and you keep jumping and jumping and jumping and jumping until you fall, get up, jump and jump and jump. And so I thought, well, why don't I just do that with comics? Why don't I get up at 4 a.m. and why don't I just keep making them nonstop? And that is exactly what I did. And because I did that, I got pretty good, pretty damn fast, um, which is fantastic. And I was lucky enough uh, to have a dad who worked in tech. He had an Instagram before me and he was like, Tilly, I think you need an Instagram. And I was like, stop again with you telling me what to do with my life. But he was right. Um, so I made an Instagram, I made a Twitter. And while I was at CCS, I started putting my work online. A random British man saw it, sent me an email and said, hello. I'm Ricky, imagine this in a British accent. I run a publisher, publisher, two guys in England with day jobs, but publisher. Um, they were like, can we, 
can we publish your stuff? And I was like, I think this is a scam, but sure, why not? I was 18, I didn't know, I didn't know any better. Um, and it turned out it was not a scam, it really was just two lovely British men who love comics, saved up some money and used it to publish random people in, in you know, they found people on the internet and published books by them. Now when I say book, I mean like 60 page little volumes, um, but published nonetheless. And they said, Could, should we publish some of your, the work you've made or do you wanna make something new? And of course that ice skater in me is like, I gotta keep jumping, I gotta keep getting better. I was like, I will make something new. And so even though I was in school, I sat down and outside of my schoolwork, I made this book, it's called The End of Summer. Um, and as you can see, I tried really hard on every panel. I have since adopted a more relaxed way to make comics where I don't put things in architecturally crazy locations because this was too much, um, but I learned a lot. And it was fantastic. And because I had such a good experience with Ricky and Dave, my two British men of Avery Hill Publishing, which has since become a much more legitimate publisher, um, I'm very happy for them. They put out a lot of books each year. And they also now, their books make their way to the US. My parents were very disappointed that the first book I published they could not get because it was only in England. Um, but that's okay. <laughs> they got over that um, once I found a big publisher, but that was later. Um, and while I was wrapping up my time at CCS, Ricky and Dave asked me to do another book. They were like, that was fun. Want to do another 60 page comic? And this was the moment where I had been living on my own for a while. I had made one book, one small book. And every, I think, queer artist or creator has a moment when they're ready to start putting queer content in their books. And so I was finally like, I've been a lesbian for a really long time. And at my school, everyone was fine with it. There were not many cute girls, but that was okay. Everyone was still fine with who I was. I was like, maybe now is the time for me to actually write a story that has a lesbian in it. And that was this book that I made called I Love This Part. And it was pivotal, not because of really what the story is itself. It's just a sad gay story. It's just two girls who fall in love and then they fall out of love and everyone cries and it's over. I mean, it sounds like something a 19 year old would write. That's exactly what I wrote. Um, but it set me off on this course of realizing that I can put myself in my work. And it was really exciting. Um, I did one more book with Avery Hill, little old Ricky and Dave. They said, round three, let's do it, do another one. Um, it's important to note these books were not selling at this point, not in the slightest, and they were very small print runs, but What's interesting about the publishing industry is sometimes it's about sales that gets you far and other times it's about relationships. Ricky and Dave and I really got along. We all liked the same comics, we liked each other. And so at the time, they didn't care that they were losing money on me. They were like, this is fun, let's just do another book. And I talk to my students about it all the time who have aspirations of getting published. And some of it is about how you market yourself and some of it is also just who you become friends with and who you really take the time to like have a good relationship with. Um, so I made my third book with them, A City Inside. That's, I don't really know how to describe. It's a little bit strange. I think I was like hitting a point where I was like, I need to do something artsy. I need to do something that isn't narrative. So I don't know. Um, it's fine. It's a good book, but everything that I was doing at CCS led me to make this book, which is called Spinning, um, which is the first graphic novel that I made um, because of those small books that I published in England. Um, a, a cartoonist named uh, Isabel Greenberg happened to be at a British comics convention, saw one of my books, read it, liked it, mentioned to her agent, who happened to be an American, that, oh, there's this girl, I, I liked her book, you should check it out. And that's how I got my agent, Seth. Um, and I signed with him. He said, what have you got cooking? Let's sell a book. I was at the point where I had been working uh, as a cleaner at a hotel. I was pretty over that, even though I was excellent at making beds quickly and especially good at cleaning the bathrooms. Lots of tips and tricks for that if you need that. Um, but I was getting sick of it. I really wanted to start making money doing this. And because I found my agent, Seth was like, I can maybe get you at most $50,000 for a graphic novel, but you need to come up with a good idea. And I was like, I want $50,000. I want to make a graphic novel. Let's do this. And at CCS, my senior thesis had been uh, a collection of stories about ice skating because I was a figure skater. And not only was I a figure skater, I was a synchronized skater, which is where like a lot of girls like link arms and like skate in the exact same way together. It's a ridiculous sport. It's very competitive. I have a lot of feelings about synchro. Um, 
And I intended all these comics about ice skating to be funny. I had a lot of really funny experiences. I was Cookie Monster on ice briefly. I was in Glee on ice and I was the cheerleader, but there was a problem because I wore glasses and apparently cheerleaders don't wear glasses and I didn't have contacts and it was this whole big thing, like can she be the cheerleader if she's wearing her glasses? So I really wanted to tell these funny stories. But what I discovered in trying to work on this book, which it turned out Seth was able to sell for $50,000, um, which was amazing to me, um, I discovered that there was a lot more trauma um, connected with ice skating than I expected. Um, I never really realized that I, I, I skated competitively for 12 years. Um, and for about 10 of those years, I didn't really like it. And it really, it really wore me down. I had some pretty abusive coaches and I had a lot going on in my life outside of skating. And this was the first time I worked on a project where I realized I, I maybe couldn't do this. I was like, I'm actually hitting a wall here. I, every time I tried to draw myself on ice and I got to my legs, I totally froze up. I just could not move my hand and it's because we had a lot of a lot of body stuff going on with skating. We were expected to be very thin, um, but uh, I was able to eventually push through and make the book. And I started by making these black and white stories about skating that looked like this. Um, and I made a bunch, of, a bunch of them. And then an editor helped me turn those into a rough draft of a book, which looked really ugly. And I did on a very crappy tablet, um, but it doesn't matter. Your book doesn't have to look good in the middle of the process. It just has to look kind of good at the end of the process, which eventually it did look very good. So it's fine. Um, and the book ended up becoming purple. We splashed some yellow in there. I, I don't think I actually dealt with the issues before I made this book, but after the book came out, it was almost like it, it was, I was able then to sort of accept that like, I got it on paper, now I need to actually do the human work of figuring out how I feel about all this. And how I feel about skating now is, is very different from how it is portrayed in the book, even though there, there are of course a lot of commonalities, but it's this funny thing that you have to accept as an artist, which is that at the time, that was how I felt about all of it. And there's nothing wrong with that. And if I ever want to go back and write about this again, I feel like I can. Um, not that I have any time because I'm in the middle of quite a few other books, but it's really interesting how your feelings about things change. And when you publish them, it's, it's just a frozen moment in history. Um, but Spinning came out and it helped lead me to make other comics like this one, which is on a sunbeam, which is uh, a big, raucous sci-fi queer thing. Um, I realized halfway through this very long book that there were no men in it. And my editor was like, you wanna just keep it that way? And I was like, yeah, sure. Um, but it's funny that after it came out, people were like, there's no men, it's so political. And it's like, I literally just forgot. Um, and then I didn't wanna go back and add them into the crowd scenes. Um, but it's a, really, it's a really fun story and the entire thing is available and free to read online. If there's a teenager in your life um, who feels like they need some representation, On a Sunbeam is a lot of fun. Um, and while I was working on On a Sunbeam, I started keeping a sketchbook. The image on the right is from my sketchbook. And I started to realize this sort of uh, connection between my sketchbook and my comics, but again, I still don't, I still have a little bit of that kid in me that when I have a nice notebook and I put a line in it, I feel like that line is wrong. I still kind of feel that way about sketchbooks. I can't really totally relax when I'm in a sketchbook. It's why I like comics because I pencil it, I plan it and I draw it and I do my best. Um, I'm a very serious artist. I'm not so much a relaxed artist, which is very interesting because my wife is a cartoonist and she's a very relaxed artist. She can sit, she can doodle, and I just look at her and I'm like, how are you doing that? How are you so calm? This is so intense, the thing that we do. Um, but everything I do is intense, I can't help it. Thank you, figure skating. Um, and after On a Sunbeam, I made a book called Are You Listening, uh, which uh, is a graphic novel about two people on a road trip through Texas dealing with trauma the usual, what you do. Um, and I, as these years have gone on, so I made those books for Avery Hill, I made Spinning, Sunbeam, Are You Listening? All these books, 
kind of the same. Um, you know, they all, oh wait, not that yet. Um, but they all have like, they're very sensitive, they're very quiet. Um, people are surprised when they meet me because I sound a little outgoing and in spinning, I'm like so quiet and shy. And it's like, well, I was quiet and shy before, but I definitely had kind of a vibe for what my books were. They were just quiet, they were gay, there were drawings of backgrounds, people liked them okay. That seemed fine. And I thought I was just gonna keep going on and do that forever. Um, the only sort of a slight variation in there is I made a picture book with my wife, Emma, um, called My Parents Won't Stop Talking. And this was really fun because I drew the backgrounds and she drew the characters. Can you see how relaxed she is with these character drawings, right? Such freedom she has in her art. Um, but I did that. Um, and this is all to say, I really thought my career was pointed in one direction and I did not expect that this would show up. Um, if you've ever heard of The Walking Dead, uh, it's a TV show, it's a comic, it was originally a comic by Robert Kirkman. Um, it is also a video game uh, made by Telltale and I was just lying on my floor one day, as you do, reading my phone when I got an email um, from Skybound, the folks that published The Walking Dead, and they were like, want to do some books in The Walking Dead universe? You want to make some books about this video game character, Clementine? And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't, what, you're, like, you're asking me, Miss Sensitive Gay, like, to do a zombie book? And they were like, yeah, we want to, like, bring The Walking Dead to queer people, to young people. Um, and I was like, I was skeptical at first. I really was because I honestly felt like I was not particularly suited to do a zombie story. Um, but they said these books would be about this girl, Clementine. And I was like, well, I love a female protagonist. Why don't I play these video games that Clementine is the protagonist of and see what's what? So I ran over at, uh, to my then girlfriend, now wife's house. She had a gaming PC and I was like, honey, I gotta play a game. And I sat down and I played all the Clementine video games and they were really fun. And it turned out Clementine is a really interesting character. She's a young girl when the zombie apocalypse starts. She has trauma after trauma piled on top of her, but she continues to persevere and survive. She's tough, she's serious. Sound familiar? Um, and I really, I really connected with her. And a lot of people have connected with Clementine. It is an extremely popular video game and she is the heart of it. She has a lot of fans. And at the end of the video game, she gets bit by a zombie and her leg has to be amputated. So Clementine is also disabled. Uh, she's a unilateral below the knee amputee. And all of this was sort of, I was thinking about all of this and I was like, let's do it. I don't know if I can do it. I'll try my best. They were like, it's a trilogy. I was like, great. My wife and I want to have a family someday. Hopefully these books pay for it. Um, but also creatively, let's go for it, right? And so, oh wait, I already answered this question. How did this project come about? You guys know how this project came about. There's Clementine. What is interesting is that they asked me to continue her story beyond the video games. So I got to basically look at the video games as her past and then think about creating her future, which, was, which I'm gonna get into. Um, but I think a really big question for me is why tell a story in the apocalypse? Why tell a zombie story to begin with? Uh, their zombies are gross. Uh, they require a lot of stabbing in the head. This motion, very difficult to draw. Try to draw someone holding a knife. It's really hard. It's like drawing someone holding a spoon. Also extremely difficult. Um, so drawing wise, I was worried. And I had never even considered that I would make something even close to the horror genre. But when I thought about it, I was like, what, what is a zombie story really? Zombies are the enemy. They're a manifestation of everything bad in the world, everything wrong. But it really fascinated me that the demons that these characters are fighting against, at least some of them are actually right in front of you. And it, it made sense to me because for a lot of my life, I feel like I've been chasing demons that I couldn't see. And I loved that in, the, in Clementine's story, she has, she has truly something wrong in this world that she can try to take down. But in a way, that's a distraction from what's really going on inside her. And I realized through the Walking Dead comics, the TV show, is that they're not actually stories about zombies. They're stories about survival. And they're stories, most interestingly, about remaking the world. And the idea of a teenager with a disability who is canonically queer remaking the world, 
I was like, yeah, I'm into that. Let's do it. Um, there were a lot of questions uh, from kind of the, the team. I was writing these stories and drawing these stories, but everyone kind of wanted to know, like, Tilly, what are you going to do with Clementine? She's a really beloved character. Please don't mess this up. Um, they were like, what are you going to do? And I thought a lot about how her past was one of trauma. And to recover from that, I think, you know, I, there's so many female characters in a lot of stories like these that are badasses that just sort of conquer everything. And I loved the idea of a female character who was a badass, but who could not conquer everything. She has limitations and she has to hit walls because that's what happens. The true badass in this world is someone who gets through low moments, not someone who doesn't have low moments. So I really wanted to try to humanize Clementine. This is a graphic novel. It's not a video game. And in a graphic novel, we have space for emotion. We have space for world building. We have space for really integrating who a character is. And all of these ideas started to come together and I started to come up with a story for Clementine book one. Now book one takes place in Vermont um, because uh, I was like, I'm in Vermont. Why would I not, why would Clementine not be in Vermont? It makes so much sense that you would be right here. Also a lot of The Walking Dead takes place in Georgia and Virginia, all down south. I was like, let's go to the mountain, let's go to the winter. And I couldn't help myself, I'm so sorry but the name Killington is just too appropriate. I thought it was hysterical. And the editor was like, absolutely not. You are not having Clementine go to a mountain called Killington. And I was like, it's real. She's got to go. And, they, and I was like, how great that like all the tourists would leave and the mountain would be taken over by zombies and Clementine and her friends that she meets along the way would come back to reclaim and find a piece of Vermont to build a home for themselves. And so book one is about Clementine on her own, struggling with, you know, everything in the book. Um, and she meets an Amish boy named Amos. She meets some creepy twins. I'm a twin, so I'm allowed to say twins can be creepy. Um, but they turn out to not be that creepy, actually. And then she also meets a girl from Canada named Rika, um, who has really bad eyesight. She's a Sephardic Jew like me. And she's very sassy. She's very cute, too. See more later for that. Um, and all of this comes together in a story that is about Clementine figuring out who she is, but also who she is with these other people. And the trilogy itself is going to be about, and I know it's going to be about this because I'm in the middle of working on book two, it is about Clementine's journey with her friends, with love, with herself, with death, with tragedy. Um, and a lot, you know, sort of the biggest theme of book one that I was thinking about, it's like if you're a teenager and you're in the zombie apocalypse, every day is just like a hellish exercise in surviving. That sounds like it sucks, first of all. No thank you. You would not get a good night's sleep ever. Um, but what if by the time you're 17, you're actually so good at killing zombies that you find a way to make peace, at least a little bit, with the world that you live in, right? If zombies are like trees and they're everywhere, at a certain point, the kids of the apocalypse are going to be like, zombie, fine, I'll take care of it. I'm not scared anymore. I'm not scared of death. Death has been all around me. And so for Clementine, as she ends her teenagehood and enters adulthood, the biggest kind of theme that she's struggling with is the idea that she might actually live a really long life because everyone around her has been dropping like flies. Everything has been about the moment. But what about when you're bored and you're wondering, am I gonna be on my own forever? Am I gonna fall in love? Am I gonna ever have a house? How do you get a house these days? There's no money, There's you can do anything. Like, where am I gonna be? Who am I gonna be? Clementine sees adults around her and she has no idea what kind of adult she's gonna become because she never actually fathomed that she might live. And so that's a really big part of this story is her not just struggling with death, but struggling with life. And her disability uh, is a huge part of this book, being an amputee. And I was fortunate enough to, the team at Skybound got together a team of people for me um, to work on what life is actually like as an amputee. I worked with a bilateral amputee, a unilateral amputee, and a disabled person who was in a wheelchair, and they are all delightful and so much fun. We just had our meeting about book two, and 
these books would not be possible without them. I have no idea what it's like to move through the world as an amputee, what it feels like, what it means to have a prosthetic, what it means to decide to not use that prosthetic anymore because it hurts all the time. Um, and so while the trilogy is about Clementine's growth as a person, it really is her growth as a disabled person as well because you know, a pro there, I really wanted to make sure, and I learned this from my team, that she's not just gonna find a prosthetic and boom, everything's fine. You know, her journey with her residual limb and with how she feels about it, how she feels about being sexy, how she feels about moving through the world, what pace means to her, this is like a long journey for her. And it's really gonna change as the books go on. Where she's at in book two with her disability is completely different than where she's at in book one. Um, and it's been, to be honest, the most delightful part of this project. I did not think that working on a Walking Dead book would teach me so much about this part of the world and this experience and the friends I've made with our consultants and how much I feel like the story is theirs as it is mine has been so incredible. And I tell my students all the time, it's like you can say yes to a job for money, you can say yes to a job for a claim. You can say yes to a job because it sounds interesting, but none of those things might, none of those things could end up being why that job is important to you. And the zombies don't matter to me at all. The franchise, it doesn't really matter. What matters is what I've learned through Clementine on this series. Um, it's made such a difference to me and I'm so proud of it. Um, and of course, like I said before, the book is set in Vermont. Clementine has got to pass through Pennsylvania briefly, hang out with some Amish people. Um, the Amish people are doing very well in the zombie apocalypse, not surprising. Um, but setting was really important because I love Vermont. I really do. I think the seasons are huge. I think the seasons are a character. And so of course I set the book in the dead of winter because what on earth happens when a zombie is in the snow? I spent a lot of time talking with Robert Kirkman and my editor about zombie mechanics in the snow. I was like, do they have icicles on them? Would the icicles cut you? If the icicle cuts you, that's not a zombie bite, but mm, what if it has some zombie juice in it? Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking about that, but a lot of the backgrounds in the book were drawn simply by looking out my window. My wife and I live on the border of Norwich and Thetford, kind of way far flung out on a dirt road. And so much of the scenery in the book is is like our backyard, which makes me really happy. And of course, Killington, um, which we drove up to and took a bunch of pictures of in order to draw ski lifts. You think drawing a person eating with a spoon is hard? Drawing a ski lift is harder. I regret it, but I got through it. Um, there are a lot of challenges in doing this series. Clementine is a really beloved character. Um, I've tried to do my best with her. Not everyone has loved what I've done, but there's not much I can do about that except continue to try to do my best. Um, drawing zombies is pretty tricky, but as I say to my students and as I say to myself all the time, you know, if your job is to draw things all day, the least I can do is try to not be scared of the drawing itself. You know, it's, it's easy to say, it's hard to do in practice. I still get overwhelmed by certain drawings when I'm doing them, but trying to feel like it doesn't matter how the drawing comes out. I just have to try. They're paying me to try. They're not paying me for the outcome. I mean, they are, but I don't tell myself that. I tell myself that they really are just paying me to put my best foot forward. And it's really, it's really carried me through this series. As you can see, it's drawn really differently from a lot of my other books. It's much more realistic. It's in black and white. So I can't lean on color to hide things that I don't want people to see, like a messy drawing. Um, but that's great because the challenges have helped the series become what it is. Um, I do not write scripts. I think writing scripts is so boring. I don't think I'll ever do it um, unless someone forces me, but even then I'd probably just be like, have your money back. I'm not gonna write a script. Um, so my process for Clementine for book one and for book two is to tell my editor my idea. We go back and forth on it. He's like, great, sounds good. Will you please write an outline? And then I like really half-ass an outline for him. And then I sit down to draw the whole book in pencil and I ignore the outline that I, wrote for my editor because I don't want to be tied down. I got to like follow my path. Uh, writers sometimes call it a discovery draft when you basically just try to write the book and discover what it's about as you're writing it. And to do that in comics is more labor intensive because you have to draw the whole book to discover what it is. But I have never thought it's a bad thing to redraw something. And so my, I have drawn, I drew Clementine book one like three different times in pencil because the first draft of it 
was, not surprisingly, terrible. It made no sense. Yes, Vermont looked great, but the characters were like not all there. They were not fleshed out. And so then my challenge was try again, draw it again, um, and reach deeper, really figure out what it's about. It's kind of an infuriating process, but it's one that I have trapped myself in because I decide to figure out the book by drawing. Um, but that's okay. And the same thing happened with book two. My God, I thought I was going to get it right the first time. I always think I'm going to get it right the first time. I didn't, and I drew it three times, and now I'm on the final draft of it, thank God, because it has to come out next year. Um, but I ink things traditionally. I think, do I have? Oh yeah, so this is what uh, the draft in pencil looks like. In the past, I had done pencil drafts on paper, but because these books have to come out very quickly, uh, I drew it digitally uh, in Procreate on an iPad, which is not my preferred way of working, but it's so much faster when you have to erase or move around an entire page. I can select it, I can move it. This is from book two, so don't look at it too closely. Um, and then after I do that, I ink traditionally. I ink with pens called Oto pens, O-H-T-O. They're these rollerball pens that I really like. This is a, an inked page from book two that I had a file of immediately accessible. So here you go. Also, it looks pretty, so why not? I don't think it's a spoiler that she's in water. People are in water all the time. Um, and obviously, Clementine's not going to die. The series is named after her. And then after I do that, uh, Cliff Rathburn, who lives in Montpelier, Vermont, uh, does the gray tones on the book. Because when I first did the gray tones, everyone was like, wow, Tilly, we love you, but this looks terrible. And I was like, well, find someone who can do it then, because I can't do it. Uh, so they found Cliff, who did all the gray tones on the original Walking Dead comic. And so what is really cool is it made my Walking Dead comic look a lot like the other Walking Dead comics, which is really fun. Um, Artistic goals? What on earth was I supposed to say here? I don't know. There's the ski lift, though, and our twins, and our Amish boy Amos. Um, I guess my goal in every book I've done has been to make it better than the last one. It's, it can be painful at times to realize when you do improve that the last thing you publish that's put out there isn't as good as it could be if you made it right now. It's just this never ending struggle of like getting better means accepting that something you made before is less than what you're capable of now. And I've just had to make my peace with it. When I finished Clementine book one, I was like, this is the best book I've ever drawn. I'm so proud of myself. And then I started working on book two and now I'm inking it. And I was like, shit, this is the best book I've ever drawn. Now Clementine book one doesn't look as good to me. It doesn't feel as good to me because everything I learned on book one, I've used to make book two better. Um, but it's something every artist has to make peace with. And I really believe that there is no point where I will actually be done learning how to do this. Every single day that I draw comics, I am learning a new way to draw something. What's funny about comics is you have to draw people from like every angle imaginable and then draw it like again and again and again. Um, there's a lot of walking, drawing Clementine with her cane. In book two, she uses a wheelchair, learning to draw the wheelchair properly. There's just like never ending challenges, but that's what keeps my job interesting. And it's still far superior to cleaning hotel rooms, of course. Um, and so this is the cover of book one. This is the cover of book two. <laughs> Maybe someday I'll get to book three. I have to because I have no choice. Um, and it's a series that I think will really change how I make work in the future. Um, after this is done, will I make another book with zombies? Unlikely, in all honesty. I'm definitely getting my fill of zombies. God love them. Um, and I will miss Clementine when this series is over, but it's... I think one of the reasons I said yes to this job is it was so different from what I was doing before. And now that this is my normal, I can't wait to then again do something that's different from this. It's just this never ending process of trying to change up sort of the framework of the story you're telling so you can feel like you're telling a new story. You don't wanna feel like you're telling the same story over and over again, even though in a way we all do. We draw ourselves, we write our own lives. Every time I draw a mom character, she has short hair. Why? My mom had short hair. I can't help myself. It doesn't look like a mom and she has long hair. I can't do it. Um, so there's so much to in this series that is connected to me, um, which is, it's funny to think that my books in the Walking Dead universe could feel 
autobiographical, but they, they do feel autobiographical in a way. And what's also interesting about Clementine Book One is a book is a reflection of your life in the year that you make it. And in the year that I was making Clementine, I had moved back to Vermont, I got married, I bought a house, I like so much about my life solidified and became so beautiful. And I hope that like some of that feeling, despite it being kind of a dark story, is, is in there. And now I wonder how in book two, this life that my wife and I are living is going to like find its way into the book. And I love that you can write fiction and still like the aura and the atmosphere of your life will find its way in. I think that's so beautiful. Um, and while I was working on Clementine, I was also secretly working on another book um, because why not? It's by Tegan and Sarah, I have to do it. So uh, if you ever heard of Tegan and Sarah, they are a lesbian twin pop duo from Canada. And they hired me to draw a graphic novel about their childhood in Canada. It's like really silly. It's really sweet. Um, you know, they form a band, they have crushes, they have funny parents. Um, it's all hijinks and, and cartoony drawing. And I worked on this while I was working on Clementine and it became so nice to like take a moment, put the apocalypse away. Here is Calgary. Here's like sixth grade, biggest problem is just that I don't know what to wear today. It was so nice to have the contrast between the series. Although I don't think I would recommend someone who is like, you know, eight, they can read junior high, but I don't know if I'd have them read Clementine just yet. So it is strange to think that next year, this book will come out um, and also Clementine book two will come out, but who cares? You can do whatever you want. Um, I have some artist friends who are like, oh God, like I write for kids. I can't do something for adults. It's like, yes, you can. Um, just have on it that kids can't read it. Or I don't know, people are discerning. It's totally fine. I have a lot of respect for artists who are fine jumping genres, jumping ages, just doing whatever they want um, and following, following where, you know, following their ideas wherever they may go. So, that is most of what I've got. Um, Clementine book one is out now. Junior high will be out next year. Clementine book two will be out next year. Um, I have to start working on book three as soon as Clementine book two is done. Uh, my days are jam packed. I was drawing this morning and as soon as this talk is over, I will go home and I will continue to draw um, because I am behind on book two already. It should be close to done and I'm on page 62 out of 240 something. Um, but that is life as a cartoonist. It takes forever to make comics. If anyone here has ever tried to make a comic, it takes forever. Um, but it's also one of the reasons that I teach. I teach now at the Center for Cartoon Studies. I also teach summer workshops at the Center for Cartoon Studies and everything that I kind of struggle with when I'm working on a page of comics, I try to just be like, just save it and talk to your students about it. And I love being able to work with students on what they're facing and to share with them what I'm facing and help them make more stories if that's what they wanna do. Um, so I somehow managed to make this perfectly 45 minutes, which means we have 15 minutes for questions, if I can read a clock correctly. I'm right, yes, amazing. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions about anything? I can talk about Anything at all. Yeah. Like when you said you met with the consultants who sort of helped you understand yeah. sort of the amputee stuff. What was that like? Like were you guys on Zoom? Did you see each other in person? So we were on Zoom. We all live in really different places. I would have loved if we could have been in a room together. Um, but it also, I think, would be an imposition on their lives to be like, can we all meet in where? Like California, Vermont? So it was multiple meetings um, where we sort of start the dialogue with each book, not talking about the story, but by me just asking them questions that feel relevant to the story. So I asked them about, like I asked Joe, uh, like what was it like with your first prosthetic? What did that feel like? And actually Joe Beckwith, one of the, one of the consultants has a really great Instagram called at Footless Joe. Um, and she talks a lot and very openly about life as an amputee. So it, part of it is like kind of me interviewing them and really just digging into their experience. And what's interesting is the three of them together, the three consultants, they're kind of all buddies. And 
we go off on these tangents and these meetings can be really long because they start talking about something and then Iman is like, oh my God, you're totally right. This was so annoying. Let me tell you about this one time. And so I get the privilege of just kind of being there and listening and taking notes and drawing things that come up. And then from there, they read a draft of the book. Everyone gives me notes on all sorts of sections, not only on the narrative itself, but on language and on anything that feels ableist, on anything that also just feels incorrect. Um, and this also helps where one of our consultants is a person of color, and so Clementine is biracial, so she also provides anything that feels relevant. Um, but I'm so lucky because Skybound is a big company and they didn't have to do this. They could have just said, like, make the book, it's fine, get it done. And what's interesting and challenging about working with these consultants is it always changes something big. Like there were some changes where I had to go in and adjust art on nearly every single page, but we have to do it. It's like, if we're gonna put Clementine on the cover of the book, if this is actually gonna be her story, then deadlines will be pushed, print runs will be late in order to make it happen. And the same thing just happened with book two, where I don't think it's a spoiler to say that there, there's some boating, um, there's some people on boats at a certain point, and we had, we like got to talk about adaptive sailing, what it's like to, it's just like so much cool stuff that you don't think about um, when, when it's not a part of your life. So I, I have so much respect for them and I sort of hope they wanna to continue to like be my friends after this uh, is over. And, and really like I, all of their names are in the back of the book too. If you wanna like see who they are and, and see what they do, they like write articles. And there was a, like a long kind of paper about disability in the Walking Dead universe that I can't recall who wrote it, but about how even before Clementine showed up, Rick, I believe loses his hand um, and because of the way zombies work, where you get bitten and then you have to usually remove whatever they bite, it's a world in which disability is so much more visible. And so it makes sense that all of these people trying to recreate the world, in my mind, would recreate a world that is much more accessible. And so that's one of the things I'm sort of building towards in books two and three, and that I couldn't do, I couldn't do without my, lovely consultants. Um, and Skybound has been, they've just been such a great company to work for. And like I mentioned before, I, I have not been totally loved on the internet because of, because of Clementine, but Robert Kirkman, everyone at Skybound has totally stood behind me. I'm the first woman to ever work on write or draw The Walking Dead. And so I feel really proud. Pretty sure I'm also the first lesbian if I'm the first woman. Um, I'll take them both. And, uh, yeah, a long-winded way of saying the conversations are long, they lead to many, many editorial changes, and they're all fantastic. And I do them right away. I know, it's really great. <laughs> so, Tilly, because of, you know, I consider you like a, the, you know, from the world builder perspective. Oh yeah, you, you took, you took you a, like a, a right, so, the, so your world, your apocalypse world that you have to build, um, so you, you so it seems like most of your time is spent just on your main character. Mm -hmm. In other words, do you feel like your world is delivered to you via the imagery and the game? Mm -hmm. Or did you have to kind of figure out, like look at some other types of papers about, you know, what are we gonna do when the robots come kind of thing? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Is it, do you, or do you feel comfortable just go ahead, like you said, mm -hmm. you don't mind, you like, it's like this, this is my world. You know, it's interesting, I feel like working on the Walking Dead series has been, it's like I have this huge field to play in, but there is a fence around that field. Like there are limits to what I can do in the world based on what Robert Kirkman established and on what he has planned. So like I can't do something kind of ahead of the overall timeline that Robert has going. I mean, he, like he holds it all in his head. So I have done, so some of the world building came from the games, but because none of the games took place in Vermont, all of building the world in Vermont and the settings for the next two books has been up to me. And so a lot of the research has been my own and it actually led me on this kind of insane tangent where my editor did not let me do this and it's probably for the best, but in thinking about like how a world breaks down, I got really obsessed with sewers and I, well, I was like, okay, okay. In The Walking Dead, you kill a zombie and then you like move on, but that zombie is still there 
right? Decomposing, it's already disgusting and full of germs. There would be no clean water. I just like it hit and I'd like, and also everyone is going to the bathroom outside. No plumbing. And you know, the wor world population is a lot smaller, but I was like this combination of everyone going to the bathroom outside, all these zombies decomposing everywhere. I was like, the cholera would be out of control. And I was so excited, I was like the whole, I, was, I changed my course. I was like, the series is gonna be about cholera and about like proper sewage management. And my editor, he was like, no, please stop, please stop. You can have like a side storyline about this if you want. And I ended up talking to someone who works uh, for kind of the sewage system of New York City. And I was like, can I talk to you about toilets and the apocalypse? And she was like, I've been waiting for someone to ask me about this. I have so many thoughts about it because right now we take clean water and we put it in our toilets when there are so many other ways. I see I'm so clearly passionate about this waste, but like composting toilets, there is gonna be a composting toilet in book two. So when you all see it, you'll be like, I can tell she's passionate about it. It's gonna be brief. I couldn't make the whole story about about it, but yeah, but infrastructure breaking down is fascinating. It's yeah. it's so cool. I also love the idea that for I mean, as a teenager, I would have loved there to be no boundaries on what I could go inside. Like if I could have just gone inside anyone's house and like seen everything, these kids can go wherever they want. I mean, there might be like a stranger there who could kill them, but if there's not, like abandoned malls, all these old schools. And another huge part of the series that I totally forgot to mention is that Clementine makes, uh, becomes friends with Amos, Ricca, and these twins, and they're all around the same age, and so they all stopped school at about second or third grade. And I got really, I, like, I tried to find out exactly what you've learned at that point, and so like what their reading level is, what their math level is, and what it would be like for them to try to read like a modern book that they just pick up. And so in, in book one, they're like trying to get through a book together, but they have to have a dictionary and have to like really work through a lot of reading comprehension difficulty. And I also realized that part of what I wanna do with this series is, is find a way for these teenagers to have an education and have an education in a way that is possible in this universe. And I, I won't say how, cause it's gonna come up later, but I just thought it would be so interesting to really just know that a fraction exists but not really remember how a fraction is. And like they have a point in book two where they're trying to remember multiplication, like what, what is multiplication? Um, so I love, I love the tangents I can go off on them because that's another part of world building. It's like your history and they forget most of it. Some of them don't even know their last name. Why would you know your last name? Yeah. Yeah, so like in On a Sunday, like all your other books, they're very like dreamy and like almost like imagination. Was it hard to kind of like bring yourself like from that kind of like dreamy place into like a real, like apocalyptic? It was so hard. I, I love dreamy stories, but part of why I love dreamy stories is like you can get away with a lot narratively when it's dreamy. You're like, oh, that side character, it doesn't matter. We're fine, we're over here. I mean, I always worked hard on my stories, but I think only to a point because I, I thought the atmosphere was the most important and I really loved the atmosphere of my stories. And in these books, my editor won't let me get away with a single panel that does not make sense. He, he's fine with me bringing in like atmosphere and emotions and everything that I love, but the narrative has to be so grounded and have such direction. It was really hard. It, like, it was totally out of my comfort zone. I did not know if I could do it and I couldn't have done it without a good editor. So yes, it was super hard making that transition. Um, I learned a lot and I definitely realized I had gotten really comfortable in the kinds of stories I tell, which is not a bad thing. It's a really beautiful thing that I got there, but it also means that it might be time to get out of your comfort zone. Um, but yeah, like Sunbeam was sort of as far as I could take, like kind of dreamy, but also big, because it's a really big narrative. Um, and now I don't know what it's gonna look like when I try to write a story again on my own, if it's gonna have some like residual stuff from my editor of like direction, building up the third act, all this stuff. Um, all this stuff that I, I really thought I wasn't good at. I mean, I don't, I've always felt like I was good at drawing, but I didn't really know if I was a good writer or not. And in comics, it's sometimes hard to tell. Um, 
but working on Clementine by really focusing on story and not just on atmosphere, I think I became a better writer because of it. But sometimes I miss the dreamy days <laughs> where, where there's like no rules either to the universe. I have to like, I have to make sure everything works really. Um, but constraints are very healthy for an artist. They're fantastic actually. Open-ended questions, paper, terrible. I don't know what to do with it. It's just too difficult. But having the character of Clementine, having this world to work within was actually extraordinarily like creatively freeing, which is really cool. It's why my students do so well when I give them assignments. It's like as soon as I tell them what, like make a comic that's based on a, an Aesop's fable, they're like, okay, I got it, I'm going. Whereas if I said just like make a two page comic, they're like, uh, I don't know what to do. Yeah, that kind of relates to my question, like early on, or with your students, like, and you're doing so many of different drawings and different stories. What are, what are you doing to create kind of a spark for so many different things in a row? So I all I decided early on after the class I took that kind of inspired me to make more comics that I would start with a one-page comic. Then I'd make two page, three page, four page. So that was the first constraint is that my comics would progressively get longer by one page. And then each comic had to be in a different style. So the first one I drew in black and white, kind of realistic. The second one I had to do in color and it had to be cartoony. The third one, less color, a mix of both. So everything had to be visually different from the last. Um, and the same was true, not just for how the drawings looked, but for how the pages were constructed. So if the one page comic was on a six panel grid, the next one had no panels and the next one had circular panels. And so it made me continually like feel out what the boundaries were. And then story wise, I wonder what my constraints were back then. I honestly don't remember much. I did make, like I made some stories that were autobiographical, some that were fantasy, some that were historical. Um, you know, I, I made comics in pencil because again, my rule of having to change the style, I ran out of options. I was like, I have to make a pencil comic. I have to make a charcoal comic. I have to paint a comic. Um, and I think making the medium and sort of the visual language, the constraint was enough to help me feel creative. But I love it. I love, I love assignments. I wish, I wish everything was sort of like school. And, and working in publishing is kind of like school, only they don't check in on you as much. They're like, okay, go draw your book, please finish it. And you're like, okay, bye. I'm just gonna sit at home alone for six months and try and draw this. It helps that my wife has the exact same job and is also working on a book. So we just sort of go back and forth. I'm like, what's messing you up today about your book? She's like, I have to draw 50 desks. It's like, well, I have to draw water. So we're both gonna have a hard day today, but it's good. We keep each other pumped up because she loves my books and I love her books. So it's great. Cause you don't always love your books or love what you're working on. Oh, wow. It's 4.30. Oh my God. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. So I know like graphic novels have sort of like poetic elements and you're talking like about autobiographical elements. Do you ever write just like poetry or a short story? I never have. I've, oh, I've always been like, should I try to write something someday? I have so much respect for writers. I really don't think I could ever be one. I'm like, they create it with just their words. When I don't know how to write something, I'm like, I'll just draw it. It's fine. It'll have emotion. I'll just put some hatching on it. Everyone loves hatching or a shadow. Suddenly it's emotional. Um, no, I've never, I've never tried. Who knows? I know some cartoonists who can also write books. They're like, they're like people who can act and sing. Makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Multi, multi-faceted. Yeah. All right, well, Tilly will be able to sign some books yeah. out um, in the lobby. And so thank you all for coming so much. It's been wonderful. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you.